Hello, Peter Wheelhauer here. Today we're going to be talking about Congress and the way that it's organized. This is the U.S. Capitol located in Washington, D.C., and the uh, United States Congress is housed in here. The United States Congress is a bicameral legislature. Bicameral is from a Latin term that means two houses. The House of Representatives has representation based on state, and the United States Senate also has representation based on state. So an important part of the American political system is understanding the importance of states in the whole process. Looking at the House for a moment, there are 435 members. That number is not fixed in the Constitution, but is based upon uh, a law that was passed once people realized that the growth of the U.S. Pop population was going to create an extremely large legislature. Uh, they passed a law in the 1920s fixing the number of members in the House at 435. Every state gets one representative, and then the remaining 385 uh, seats are redistributed uh, into the states after the decennial census. Each representative represents a single geographic district. It could be a geographically large district, like the state of Alaska, but have only one representative, or it could be an extremely small geographic area such as the Detroit metro area or New York City, where there are multiple uh, districts in a relatively small area because population size is the key characteristic. And we'll look at that here in a moment. When we look at the United States Senate, there are 100 members. And while that seems like a nice, uh, convenient, even number, that's just a function of the fact that we have 50 states. If Puerto Rico were to become a state, they would get two senators, and then we would have 102 members in the Senate. Each state represents, uh, each state gets two senators in its representation in the United States Senate. And as we understand from the from a discussion about the Constitutional Convention, this structure, a bicameral legislature with two separate chambers that are uh, designed to represent the people differently, uh, was, a, was a compromise. The Originally at the Constitutional Convention, the House of Representatives was, was thought of as a way of making sure that that population size of a state would have a large bearing in terms of representation so that big states with lots of people living in it would get more representation. Small states with fewer people living in them would get less representation. Small states objected to that though. They were concerned that large state interests would conflict with small state interests and the large states would dominate the small states. So part of the compromise cr was creating a Senate in which each state exists as an entity to uh, have equal representation. Let's look at the House. In the House of Representatives, each seat that's there sir, is a two-year term. So all 435 members, uh, uh, all 435 seats in the House are up for election every two years. And again, it's based on population. So every 10 years in the United States, we have a census. We count the population, figure out where people live, and then the seats in the House of Representatives are distributed uh, according to the population size. As we mentioned earlier, each state automatically gets one representative, and then the remaining 385 seats are, uh, are redistributed, basically in two stages. The first one has to do with what's called reapportionment. Reapportionment is the redistribution every 10 years of those 385 seats. So that if you have population shifts that occur, states that now have relatively more population, they gain seats. And states that relatively lose population, they lose representation. The process within each state of redrawing U.S. House district lines is called redistricting. So reapportionment is the redistribution of seats. Redistricting is the redrawing of U.S. House district lines. And this is important because a series of Supreme Court decisions in the 1960s said that within each state, the population of each congressional district has to be essentially equal. There's a very small margin of error that's allowed in the, in the population sizes of those districts. Now, obviously, you have politicians in most states who are the ones drawing the lines. And so what emerged very early in the United States was the process of something called gerrymandering. This is a, what's a term that's used to describe the process by which 
representatives in the process of redrawing their congressional district lines do the do so for partisan advantage. They want their own political team to have a bit of an advantage, and sometimes they work to uh, create a disadvantage for the opposing party. In 2000 in Michigan, just as an example, there were about 9.94 million people living in the state, which turns out to be about 3.5% of the U.S. population. And when we look at the 385 U.S. House seats that could be redistributed, about we got 15 of those, and that's about 3.8%. In the 2010 census, Michigan had 9.9 uh, .9 million people in it, so even fewer people than we had in 2000. And in fact, we're the only state that actually had a net loss of population between 2000 and 2010. At that point, that turned out to be 3.2% of the U.S. population, and we, had, we lost a congressional seat. So we went from 15 seats in the U.S. House to 14 seats because we had a net loss of population relative to everybody else in the country. When this happens, we can identify broad patterns that actually causes the, the effect of reducing power in Congress. So if we think about your, the number of seats that a state has in Congress as being a measure of that state's power. So California has a lot of people, so it has a lot of representatives, so it has a lot of influence. So big states like California, New York, Texas, and Florida have very uh, significant amounts of representation in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. House, whereas states like Montana, Wyoming, Alaska, even though those are geographically large areas, very few people live there, and so they have relatively less influence. So what happens is over time, as the U.S. population shifts, the power base within Congress also shifts. This map shows the changes in the U.S. population in, in the U.S. Census uh, the redistribution of seats after the U.S. Census in 2010. And we can see that the, uh, the green states here that, are, that represent kind of the upper Midwest and the, in the northeast of the states, they lost population. They lost seats here. So the fact that they're green shows that those seats went somewhere else. When we look at where they went, the arrows reflect the fact that those... That those uh, seats went to other states. In this case, it went to the southern states of Georgia, South Carolina, Florida. Four states, four seats were gained by Texas, and then one each by the other western states indicated in blue here. That's a power shift. The northeastern states now have fewer seats and therefore less power in Congress. Now, when we look at this pattern over time, one of the things we can see is that this is not just a one-time deal. This takes place over time. So in this column, we see that in 1933, Midwestern states had 90 seats. Northeastern states had 129 seats, and the Southern states and Western states had 119 and 55 seats. When we look at the region's uh, seats in Congress in 2013, 80 years later, we see a sharp drop in the number of seats in the central states and the Midwest and in the Northeast, and then a sharp increase over time in the power of southern states and the western states. This reflects changing power dynamics within Congress as well. Here in Michigan, we're concerned about how many representatives we have, and so we can see changes that took place in our population over the, over the 20th century produce changes in our representation in Congress. In the 1950s and the 1960s, Michigan and a lot of other mid industrial mid Midwest states experienced population growth. And so we increased the number of seats that we had. And over time, uh, we've seen that power diminish so that now we have fewer representatives in, 2000, in the last decade than we've had in the 20th century. Uh, and who knows what's going to happen after the current census in 2020 with representation uh, changes kicking in for 2023 in, uh, when Congress reconvenes that year. Let's take a look at organization in the Senate. In the U.S. Senate, the, uh, uh, each member serves six years. We have 100 seats, and about one-third of the Senate is up for election every two years. So think about the Senate being divided into three chunks of seats. Chunk A is up for election this year. 
Chunk B is up for election in two years. Chunk 3 is up for election in four years. And then Chunk A is going back to uh, be up for re-election in six years, and they cycle through that way. Again, the importance here is that it gives equality of representation to the states, and the purpose of that is to make sure that small states have an equal voice at some stage in the, uh, in the legislative process. The purpose here is to represent uh, the people indirectly. Originally, the U.S. senators were selected from state legislatures, and, and then we had an amendment that made them popularly elected. But still, the essence of the Senate is to uh, protect the interests of small states against the large states. The most important organizational characteristic of the of the two legislatures, of the two houses of the legislature, are committees. In this case, uh, we can look, these are the committees in the House of Representatives, and you can look at each one of these circles, if you can see them in the resolution with the video. Uh, each one of these covers a different area of legislation. So we see the Armed Services Committee here. Any legislation relating to armed services to the U.S. military has to go through this committee. Anybody who's, any legislation that's dealing with education reform, uh, or dealing with labor relations, that has to go through the Education and Labor Committee, and you can go through the different committees that are in play, uh, in, and each one of them covers a specific area. Three particular committees in the House are extremely important. The first one is the Appropriations Committee. The Appropriations Committee, basically any legislation that requires any kind of spending by the government has to be funneled through the Appropriations Committee. They're the ones that basically control the money. Over here, we see the Ways and Means Committee. Any legislation that has to do with somehow raising revenue for the government, such as a tax increase, a tax decrease, uh, increasing fees or increasing fines or penalties, all of that has to be funneled through the Ways and Means Committee. Finally, we have the Rules Committee. In the House of Representatives, every piece of legislation that's going to be voted on in the House by the whole House has to go through the Rules Committee. They're the ones who set the rules for how legislation will be voted on. How much time will be allowed for members to debate or give speeches about the piece of legislation? What are the rules specifically that are going to be allowed for how bills will be voted on? That's all set by the Rules Committee. Now, it's important to realize that this is this structure of using committees is critical to helping Congress do the work that it needs to do. There's so much legislation that comes through the political process, it's important that the, you end up with people who develop a certain level of expertise in a particular area so that they can handle the legislation. They're familiar with potential conflicts in other laws, and so that helps them to more effectively do their job. An important aspect of committees are subcommittees. So when we think about the work that committees have to do, they end up with uh, a lot of legislation that maybe is extremely specialized. And so though they, each of the committees is divided up into a variety of subcommittees, and members serve on those subcommittees to deal with the legislation. And basically, the legislative process goes something like this. In the House of Representatives, a bill is introduced, that bill is referred to a committee. In that committee, it's referred to a subcommittee, and the subcommittee is really where the heavy work is done in terms of the details of legislation. The subcommittee votes, and they give a report back to the main committee. The main committee votes, and if they pass it, then it's sent back to the House of Representatives. It might have to go through appropriations or ways and means, but if it's going to be voted on by the whole House, it has followed this process. But this could get really complicated. For example, if we're dealing with a piece of legislation that's, that deals with the environment, there are actually one, two, three, four different committees that have substantive authority in some way over environmental legislation. So it's important for, to understand that the law that's going to be, or the bill that's going to be considered has to go through all four of these committees before it can come out. Each one of these committees then has a sub, one or more subcommittees that might deal with that particular law. So if it gets sent to Energy and Commerce Committee, it would go to the Environment and Climate Change Committee. If it goes to the Agriculture Committee, it could go to the Conservation and Forestry. It just depends on the specific content of the law. 
an oversight and reform committee is an important committee because that determines kind of what is the the way that Congress is going to monitor what, how laws get implemented. Are you going to have a specific kind of ethical set of issues that are concerned with implementing these laws and overseeing them? That's dealt with by this committee. And then if any spending is involved, then appropriations also has to receive this. This is where the real work of Congress takes place. It takes place in subcommittees who then report back to committees, who then report back to the House of Representatives. We could go through the same process in explaining the Senate, but the structure is essentially the same with a handful of differences. But really, once you understand that, that each chamber is divided into committees that deal with substantive areas of law, and then each committee handles legislation principally through its own subcommittees, that helps you understand the basic process of legislation and how the whole Congress is organized. I hope you find this interesting and helpful in terms of helping to understand how the legislative process works.